The Ukraine war began a year ago, with many expecting Russia to clinch victory quickly, using military might befitting a superpower. But a year on, Ukraine has fought Russia to a stalemate, with the help of modern arms provided by Western allies. Let's take a look at how Kyiv's weapons capabilities have evolved. Before Russia's invasion, Ukraine fielded aging military hardware dating back to the Soviet Union. Some are still being used in the conflict, including the T-72 tank, which first rolled off the assembly lines back in 1969. But Ukraine's pleas for modern armory, well, they have paid off, with the West promising to deliver around 80 of the world's most sophisticated tanks, including Germany's Leopard, Britain's Challenger, and the U.S. M1 Abrams. Now, the Ukrainian military's smaller arms have also been revamped with explosive results. The U.S. sent over Javelin missiles early on in the war, quickly gaining popular use among soldiers who hailed the weapon's potency for destroying Russian tanks. Kyiv's artillery, also a prominent threat to Moscow's troops. HIMARS rockets and GPS-guided shells can hit Russian forces more accurately than unguided munitions. But Russian weapons are formidable too. The most advanced rocket Moscow has fired so far is the Kinzhal hypersonic missile. It's practically unstoppable. Flying at 10 times the speed of sound, it's too fast for most air defense systems to intercept. Iranian drones, also a problem. Russia nosedives these Shahed unmanned aircraft onto Ukraine's power grid, while Kyiv's soldiers have shot them down. More of them keep coming. And joining us now is Mark Kensian, Senior Advisor of the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or speaking to us live from Washington, D.C. Oh, Mr. Kensian, uh, Mr. Biden, President Biden in Kyiv earlier this week, promising another close to half a billion dollars in artillery and military equipment to Ukraine. Now, every fresh delivery of ever more advanced weapon systems we've seen this hope this makes a difference. This breaks the stalemate. This has not happened so far. Are we looking at wrong weapon systems so far or just the wrong way to think about how to fight and win a war? Well, the war is going to be long. Uh, the Ukrainians are doing very well. Uh, initially, of course, everyone thought that they would be defeated. Uh, they fended off the Russians. They pushed the Russians back, recaptured about half of the lost territory. The half a billion dollars in aid is a continuation of the kind of aid the United States has been providing all along, artillery, ammunition, anti-tank weapons, uh, and the wide variety of equipment and munitions that an army uh, in conflict needs. Uh, what's what's going to happen is that this is war is going to continue until one side decides that it's worth uh, negotiating. There is no silver bullet. In other words, there's no single weapon that we could give to the Ukrainians that will bring victory. Victory will come from a combination of weapons and munitions, training for the Ukrainian forces, and the resistance of the Ukrainian people. Let's uh, look at that in further detail. Of course, uh, the NATO chief warning that Ukraine getting through ammunition at a rate of many times higher than the current rate of production. Also concerns, as you mentioned, over sending over equipment for which no one has been trained properly to operate as yet. Now, uh, before we get to larger issues such as better force deployment, these things, if they are not addressed, nothing works. Whatever weapons you might actually send to Ukraine, are we putting enough attention on, for example, making, sending enough ammunition and also training people in time to use these advanced weapon systems or fighter jets? Well, both of these items are important. Uh, artillery ammunition has turned out to be one of the uh, key items that are needed because the front lines have stabilized. Therefore, artillery can be used very extensively. Uh, the war has started to look like World War I with trenches and infantry attacks and artillery barrages. The Ukrainians are currently using apparently about 90,000 rounds per month. Uh, to put that in perspective, the United States uh, before the war produced about 90,000 rounds per year. Uh, so the Ukrainians are uh, using uh, artillery at a much higher rate than um, had been expected. Uh, the United States has sent over a million rounds, and other countries have also sent uh, ammunition. The United States is increasing its 
uh, production of artillery to about 20,000 uh, a month. That would be about 240,000 a year. Uh, and then maybe up to 40,000 uh, later in a couple of years. That will keep the Ukrainians well supplied with artillery ammunition, but they won't be able to fire at the same rate that they've been firing in the past. Uh, what's going to happen is they'll have to prioritize their targets more, uh, fire only at the uh, most valuable t targets. In terms so of training, training is absolutely critical. They're being trained on new equipment. Uh, once they get trained, then the equipment is turned over to them, but that often takes weeks or usually months. Uh, they're also receiving training on uh, just the basics of military uh, uh, combat uh, for basic training and then also unit training, both of which are critical. All right, uh, Mr. Kansian, a final question here. Mr. Biden in Kiev uh, promised this, uh, if I can remember accurately, is $450 billion in artillery and military equipment, but he did not deliver on Mr. Zelensky's, President Zelensky's bigger demands, which was for fighter jets and long-range missiles such as so-called attackers. Our Western allies have caved in months before for earlier demands, such as tanks, the Leopard 2, as well as the Abrams tanks. Do you see uh, demands this time being met? And if they are, which items and over what kind of time scale? Well, there's a lot of attention on uh, advanced weapons, weapons that the Ukrainians are asking for. I think that maybe there's too much emphasis because there's no silver bullet. Uh, in terms of jet aircraft like F-16s, um, the better uh, approach would be to upgrade the aircraft that the Ukrainians already have. There's already been a lot of that wiring them to use uh, NATO and U.S. Uh, munitions. But F-16s have become such a symbolic issue. I think the United States will do what the um, uh, British have done, which is train some pilots, um, make some uh, commitments, but much later on to uh, provide maybe a squadron, uh, and then um, um, and then to continue like that, which uh, will provide a symbolic um, reassurance, but not commit to uh, sending uh, jets very uh, uh, very soon. The problem with the jets is they're expensive. They're a hundred million dollars a piece. They're vulnerable. Uh, they have to be specially configured for technology uh, transfer. In terms of the long-range strike, uh, ATACMS, which is a long-range missile, uh, can be fired from HIMARS. I think it's less likely the United States will provide those. The United States is very worried that the range of these missiles will uh, be able to strike the Russian homeland. That's one of the red lines that Putin has drawn, and the fear of escalation, I think, will prevent the United States from providing that. We may be uh, able to help the Ukrainians develop some of their own capabilities, maybe uh, enhance some Ukrainian domestically produced drones to get some of the same effects. Oh, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Mark Kenton, Senior Advisor of the International Security Program at CSIS, speaking live to us there from Washington, D.C. For more on the Russian conflict in Ukraine, we're joined now by Jeremy Koh. He's live for us from the city of Bucha in Ukraine. Jeremy, we saw the brutal scenes of death and destruction in Bucha last year after Russian soldiers retreated. What is life like now on the ground one year on? Well, Don, life here now is back to normal. Bucha is very peaceful right now. In fact, I'm just next to a small park in the middle of Bucha. I can still see uh, children strolling about. There were people walking their dogs as well. In fact, it looks just like any other middle-class uh, suburb here. But of course, there are still signs of what happened here last year. Just behind me, you can see those signs over there. It says, people live here. Imagine the fear that people experienced last year. They had to put that on their gates as well. But uh, locals tell me that didn't work because even though it was to prevent the attacks or shellings or whatever, you can still see, you can't really see it from where you are right now, but uh, there are some signs of shrapnel on these gates, on these houses as well. So when the Russian troops' plans to capture Kiev in days crumbled last year, they reportedly turned their attention on Bucha. And when they retreated from this town uh, after a brief occupation, uh, horrific stories about rape torture and shootings on the streets emerged. And in fact, when the Ukrainians re returned back in this area, they, they found uh, some streets that were strewn with bodies. And also, there were um, lots of, uh, there, were, there were some mass graves as well. In fact, just uh, hours ago, we were at a mass grave that's just beside a small church. Uh, 
you know, the bodies have been exhumed from the mass grave, so there are no signs of what happened besides a small memorial. But within the church, there is a small photo gallery showing what happened then. There were horrific pictures, uh, bodies, dead bodies with wrists bound behind their backs, and also uh, body parts emerging from the ground as well. Now, uh, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has accused Russia of committing genocide and war crimes here. Uh, his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin, of course, has denied all these claims, saying that they were staged and, and that uh, Russian troops did not commit all these atrocities uh, here. Uh, but. You know, the Ukrainians that I spoke with here in Bucha were incredulous. They said that if the Russians didn't commit it, who committed these crimes? Uh, but there, even though there's a lot of anger, there's also a desire to move on. There's a lot of rebuilding here in Bucha. And hours ago, I spoke with the deputy mayor of this town. Uh, she told me that they don't want Bucha to be forever associated with this tragedy. They also want a bright future for this town. Uh, so even though uh, that, that is the case, they still want to seek justice for what happened, however long it takes. It was a shocking attack on Bucha, Jeremy, but Ukraine has also been dealt with a barrage of more attacks over the past year. Uh, the international community very quick to lend a helping hand to the country, but uh, the support has been so wide ranging, everything from military support to humanitarian aid. You spoke to some volunteers, though, who traveled to Ukraine to offer their help. Can you tell us more about that? Well, yes, certainly. Well, there were Ukrainians from all walks of life have really stepped up in a big way since the war began. They are volunteering in all uh, areas from humanita humanitarian aid uh, to even serving as volunteer soldiers, risking their lives in the process. Now, I, I, you know, Ukrainians I spoke with say that the, the war has really united them in a way uh, never seen before. Now, I'm not saying that Ukraine was a perfect society before the war. There were lots of issues. There was corruption, uh, income issues inequality and also President Zelensky's uh, you know ratings were plummeting as well but today uh, United Ukrainians across the country are united against a common enemy uh, but besides the Ukrainian volunteers uh, foreigners from all over the world have also uh, you know either stayed on or they have come into Ukraine to help uh, Ukrainians as well uh, Asians Africans uh, you know people from all over they some of them could have chosen to leave but they chose to stay on uh, let's have a listen to find out why Harusan, as he wants to be known flew to Ukraine from Japan less than two months after the start of the war <laughs> には、まあ、言いましたけど、2人友達はいて、あの、親友が、その1人は、まあ、僕が決めたことだから、あの、自分のその意思を貫いた方がいい。He joined the Georgian National Legion as a volunteer soldier in Ukraine despite having no military background. The Legion is a military unit formed by mostly ethnic Georgian volunteers fighting on the side of Ukraine. Harusan declined to reveal the role he's serving in, but he did say that he's been to the front line and he's prepared to stay in Ukraine till the end of the war. But his role is not without risks. Last year, a Japanese volunteer fighter died in a battle against the Russian military in eastern Ukraine. Unlike Harusan, however, most of the other Asian volunteers in Ukraine are serving in humanitarian roles. Restaurant owner Yashri Tripathi considered leaving Ukraine at the start of the war, but he eventually decided to stay put as he's lived in a country nearly all his life. He's been giving food to soldiers and people in need, collecting money to buy winter clothing for troops and helping at animal shelters. You know, after, after the war started, your values have changed, like my values have changed a lot. And uh, all of a sudden, because, uh, because of the damage that's been done to economy and because of the, uh, the exchange rate of uh, US dollar, we've lost a lot of money in general. But you don't prioritize that as much because you know that you're alive, you're safe, and uh, you can bring some, uh, uh, some happiness to other people or some value to other people, so why not do that? Ukraine's vast network of volunteers, both local and foreign, have provided much-needed support to a population that's grappling with the ongoing war.
Well, despite all the talk about rebuilding, about volunteers, uh, there are still fierce fighting going on in the eastern and southern parts of Ukraine. And Ukraine is still facing a very real threat. We're just days away from the first anniversary of the Russian invasion. And Ukrainian officials have warned that uh, Russia may be planning a major offensive on that day uh, so that President Vladimir Putin could have a symbolic victory to show his people. And so we'll be here in Ukraine to tell you what happened. So stay tuned. Thank you, Jeremy. Jeremy Ko, there, live for us in Bucha, Ukraine.